Hi everyone, it's John, it's Tuesday, so naturally I have another book review for you. And uh, the book I have today is a book on a similar topic to a one that I talked about recently. In fact, it might have been the one I talked about last week, or the week before. This is a book by uh, Franz Duval, and the title is The Bonobo and the Atheist in Search of Humanism Among the Primates. Franz Duval, if you're not familiar with the name, is one of the leading primatologists working in the United States, originally a Dutch-born, but came here I think for for graduate studies sometime in the early 80s and um, he's published several books along these lines um, he's he's a primatologist but more specifically he's an ethnologist he studies primate behavior and he's long been a proponent of how much we can uh, learn from the behavior and the interactions of primates and how that can shed light on uh, human being, uh, human beings, human behavior, um, and and other questions like that. This book is a bit of an awkwardly named book, partially because it has nothing really to do with humanism, as most people would define it per se. Duvall seems to think that humanism is roughly definitionally coterminous with secular morality, uh, even though there are plenty of humanists who wouldn't describe themselves as secular, and there are many secularists who wouldn't define themselves as humanists. They're very uh, distinct sets of people and ideas. So I think to some extent that book could the book could have been better had the uh, the subtitle not been there at all. The Bonobo and the Atheist presents at least what I thought was a pretty uncontroversial thesis in in science, uh, even for someone like me whose whose grasp of the scholarly literature around primate ethology is pretty weak, if not virtually non-existent. And that thesis is that human beings aren't the only animals who display moral behavior. I think if anyone spends time around dogs, for example, um, or or pretty much um, any other domesticated vertebrate, advanced vertebrate, I don't want to use the word advanced because we're all equally advanced when it comes to evolution, but... Um, Dogs, for example, are, are a great way of showing that uh, we're not the only moral animals around. He doesn't really talk about dogs here. He talks about bonobos, especially with occasional sort of um, digressions into uh, chimps. And I think may maybe some gorillas. Um, Duvall's book is is a really good source book, actually, for these kinds of behaviors across a, a, a pretty wide range of species, again, especially primates, uh, mostly culled from anecdotes relating to his personal research at various institutions over the last several decades, mostly since he's moved to the United States. By the way, Duvall is currently the uh, Charles Howard Candler Professor of Primate Behavior in the Department of Psychology at Emory University. There are plenty of examples of chimps and bonobos showing pro-social behavior, pro-social roughly being uh, definitionally equal with moral, all over the book, and even behavior that we would call uh, strictly moral. Uh, like expressing, for example, frustration or anger at a perceived lack of fairness. If you're a reader whose curiosity was piqued by the word atheist in the title and were looking for another Hitchens or Dawkins-inspired sort of dime store screed on how religion will be the end of humanity as we know it, 
I think you'd be pretty disappointed in the book. In fact, the thesis of the book presented no reason whatsoever to even discuss the relative merits or and or drawbacks of religion, but I I guess throwing in a buzzworthy word like atheist into the title can't harm sales too much, right? At least in the United States. Uh, as is pretty clear from the summary that I tried to give above, the main idea he, that Duvall is trying to present here is that moral behavior is present, uh, present excuse me, in all higher apes. Other animals too, but especially being a primatologist, like I said, mostly focused on the bonobo and the chimpanzee here. Consequently, it should come as no surprise that these moral tendencies that he's talking about, that we share with animals, predates any idea of God, which is, as far as we know, a distinctly human idea. And not only that, but uh, they also predate any attempt at formal institutions built to worship gods like churches um, or, or any ceremonies uh, that were intended for the same thing. The big takeaway from the book is that morality, no matter in which animal it occurs, is really a product of biology, not some sort of divine revelation or supernatural intercessory ability that we get from a creator, but that our our behavior is in some ways evolutionarily shaped, and that morality was not a gift bestowed upon us, but it was, uh, he doesn't say this, but it's it's kind of implied, especially if you sort of go out on the periphery of this book and read evolutionary psychologists. I know that field has its own detractors, but um, there, there, I think there's a, an argument for the fact that many moral behaviors, uh, behaviors that we consider to be moral, are actually, actually just evolutionary adaptations. Being originally from the Netherlands, Duval was at first very perplexed at the popularity, and not to mention the, the fundamentalism that he noticed in American life when he moved here in the 1980s. And he mentions that, that perplexed attitude several times throughout the book. He moved to the States in 1981 when he was 33 years old and has spent the rest of his life here. So more than half of his life he has spent in the United States, but he still seems to be perplexed by this. Uh, maybe it's because he just grew up in, in the Netherlands, which is such he has such a different attitude towards religion. Even the religious people there, uh, there's a, a short little vignette in the book where he talks about uh, the North and South Netherlands being, uh, uh, one is Protestant and one is Catholic, and that they take religion over there very seriously, but this American fundamentalism is, is very odd to him. It's understandable why European atheists look at American atheists with bemusement because they can seem to be so passionate about something that is so obvious. However, despite all his time in the U.S., Duvall still seems to think that popularizing athe atheists with a broad American audience, again, like Dawkins, uh, Hitchens, and Sam Harris, Duvall personally thinks that Daniel Dennett is by far the most rational and thoughtful of the bunch. He he thinks that these this group the they've been called the Four Horsemen. I think it's a silly name, but whatever. Are essentially sleeping furiously. That is to say, since atheism is essentially the rejection of a proposition, they're making a big deal out of the existence of essentially nothing. They have made lecture tours and book deals and millions of dollars tens of times over on the rejection of a proposition, namely the proposition that 
love. God exists. He drives this home. He drives this point home repeatedly in the book, and it's somewhat befuddling. Here's a scientist and an open atheist, Duvall admits to being an atheist, yet he doesn't seem to see the value in doing the yeoman's work of getting bullshit like creation science or intelligent design out of the classroom where it most certainly doesn't belong. Are the Dawkins, uh, Hitchenses, and Harrises sometimes greeting and, and, and strident? Sometimes. I think, I think, I think sometimes they're, they're tin-eared inter interlocutors for the ideas that they're really trying to promote instead of parody, which they can sometimes uh, tend to seem like. But um, when, when Duvall's refers to them as sleeping furiously, again, making a big deal out of something unimportant or, or worse yet, obvious, he seems to be criticizing them for more than their just stentorian shrillness and in a country where one out of three Americans still believe that the creation account, and it's actually accounts in Genesis because there are two of them, hold the authority of science. Again, I mean, the Depending on the poll you look at, in the United States, I'll say that again, I know some of my viewers aren't uh, American, so this might surprise you and uh, even appall you, depending on your personal beliefs, between one quarter and one third, 25 and about 32 to 34 percent of Americans, depending on what day you ask them and how precisely you ask the question, think that Genesis holds the authority of science and is an accurate depiction of the universe as we know it. Let that sink in for a little bit. When, when the country is like that, we need more education about science. And I think Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, Dennett, to a lesser extent, is talking about the science. He's more interested in the, the philosophy of science and philosophy of belief. But especially Dawkins, Hitchens, and Harris, I think at their best, their most effective and their most appealing, what they're trying to do is talk about education and, and science education. I know Doc. Uh, I know Hitchens often got sidetracked into some uh, some some other uh, areas of contention and and didn't focus on science too much. But I, Dawkins, especially Harris, to a smaller degree, uh, more focused on on neurological on neurological sciences and psychological aspect of stuff and not biology, but science nonetheless. <laughs> Um, I think that's what their most important function is. And again, at their best, what they're trying to do. Only then can we get buffoons who think that the world was created in six literal days uh, kicked off the school boards and out of Congress, where they sometimes still are in the United States. But to say that they're sleeping furiously is akin to, it's very close to calling their work in vain. And perhaps it's the optimist in me. Occasionally it peeks out. I know I seem like a, a pretty unrepentantly constitutional, constitutional pessimist. But I hope that that's not the case. I'm convinced that a world that makes its decisions based on evidence and weighted consideration of the facts, and rational criticism of ideas is the best possible world that we have to offer future generations. But that kind of world doesn't just pop into existence ex nihilo. It has to be worked for. And that's why I've always imagined the most important role uh, of the public atheist 
to be education, science education specifically. And um, I know I got off on a bit of a tangent there, but uh, excuse me, I try try to avoid those in book reviews. But uh, the the thesis was such a simple one, and I think for many, uh, especially my viewers who are probably uh, a couple of standard deviations above in in most respects, will probably recognize the the truth of, of the assertion that there are many many other animals besides human beings who are moral. So I thought I would just sort of give my opinion on some peripheral topics that the book brings up in passing but doesn't deal with explicitly like uh, I wanted to. So there you have my two cents on a few topics, the book and some other stuff. Uh, this is a book by Franz de Waal. It's called The Bonobo and the Atheist in Search of Humanism Among the Primates. Let me know if you've read anything else by Franz de Waal, if all of his books are along these same lines, like I think they are, or if you've read any that strike you as perhaps a bit more, um, I don't know, uh, something, something not so obvious to most people. I don't know how obvious that that observation is about morality. Maybe it's completely... Maybe many people just live with the unquestioned idea that human beings are the only moral agents in the world. Uh, tell me, what do you think? Is that the way you've always assumed the world is organized? Um, let me know. I would be curious to know. I guess it's a little presumptuous of me to say that it was obvious. Um, I will see you next, next week, guys. Have a wonderful week. Take care.